Hello, good morning. I salute you all in the name of Jesus. You are most welcome to this program. And we are going to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father who is at in heaven, we glorify your name. We give honor to you, O Lord, because you are the only one true God. And that is why we are here, so that we can study your word. And through the study, Lord, you will speak to us and you will strengthen our faith. And even those who are thinking of making a decision, you will help them, O Lord, for the glory of your name. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you are new to this program, the purpose of the program is to study the word of God so that we are able to establish individually and completely as a people on who is the one true God. And the reason we are doing this is because it is like a wave which has come all over the world, people claiming that they are going back to their traditional way of worship. And the truth of the matter is, there is only one God. The fact that every nation of their God was a man's creation. I have explained every time we meet here. That this, house, this is our purpose. I've always explained how it started and it has moved on. And that method or a system of worship is interwoven in the culture. So much that it is not easy to get out of it because the people you call your people are within that culture. And it is in that culture they have put in their system of worship. Not as much as some communities in the world. A community like the Indians in India, they have a religion called Hinduism. And they have their gods, so many of them, in fact, more than any other nation. Because I know every nation like Egypt have got their gods. Maybe in that country they may have four or five god, gods which they worship. If you go to places like Rome, there were many gods also. Because Romans were polytheistic. They worshipped many gods. And there was no quarrel. If you go there, you go there with your God, they will show you where to put your God in that temple. What does that mean? That means every God who was brought there was in the form of an image. And those images were worshipped. If you go to places like Greece, there were so many of them. Then all over Europe, they worshipped those idols, they worshipped, some worshipped spirits. But when white men came down to Africa for economic and political purpose, they used Christianity to soften people so that they can steal from them. Those who brought the religion, Christianity were very genuine people who brought us the good news which they had received from, from the Israelites. Because at one point of time, the whole world departed from the Almighty and they worshipped all what they wanted to worship. But God himself came down to one man, Abraham, and revealed himself to him. 
and Abraham obeyed. And that is the long story, which I have always been telling here, to make it to be a starting point of our study. So it is not correct what the politicians in Africa tell us that Europeans brought Christianity with a purpose. No. They came because they also received the Christianity and they knew what Christianity could do. So it was the missionaries bringing good news. And their brethren on the other side came and took over the land. So we don't blame the religion. It is not right for anybody to call Christianity white man's religion. There are other religions which has come to Africa from other nations. We don't accuse them. Why do we only accuse Christianity? That is wrong. So it is good for everybody to know that Christianity is pure. It is good news of the word of God. And do not turn back. Because already there is struggle of cultures trying to tell their people, get off the Christianity and come back to your culture. Let us move on. Amen. So I salute you all because I am one of you. And the Almighty God has given me this chance to teach the truth of the word of God so that each one of us will know who this God is. And when you have known him, follow him, do his will, because his will is written in a book we call the Bible. It is God's will. This book was written by 40 individual authors. It is not one person writing it, but 40 people in a period of 1,600 years. They wrote the Bible, not at once, but gradually. Then it was put together as one book. So it is God's doing. When we ignore the Bible, we are ignoring the word of God. Now we have been studying the book of Hebrews, which is very much related to, uh, to this period of time. Because when this book was written, some Jews had accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior. And they moved on for a while, but there were also some in the traditional religion of the Jews called Judaism. They were convincing others who had believed in our Lord, Jesus Christ, to come back and continue with their system of worship. So the author of this book of Hebrews wrote to them so that they could know they are stirred, and they could know what they are having, the faith that they have possessed in Jesus Christ, so that they stop going back. There are a few who went back, but for how long did they stay in that faith? The center of worship those days was the temple in Jerusalem. And as you know, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the end of that temple. And the curtain in the temple was split from top to bottom, clearing the area which was closed and put there as a holy place, and another area called the Holy of Holies, where no individual could have gone in except the high priest who went there once a year 
That curtain was split. That is opening the way. It was God himself opening the way, changing the system that now everybody could approach God, could approach the throne of God. And that physical temple remained there only for a while after that. In AD 70, that temple was destroyed by the Romans. It is no longer there. So those who had gone back, whatever they went to seek there was not there because the system had changed. The old covenant was gone. We were now in the new covenant. Praise the Lord. Okay, that is a, enough introduction. Today we are going to study chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. It begins like this. Therefore, this word, therefore, when you get it anywhere, it is a connecting word. This word, therefore, is connecting chapter 11 and chapter 12. In chapter 11, we had a deep study. It took us three weeks studying that chapter. And the other wrote 17 individual names of people who had lived by faith. So it is that faith which has been preached to us so that we can possess that faith. And through that faith, we accept Jesus as our Savior. And we accept this one true God as the only God Almighty who deserves worship. And then the Holy Spirit, who is working through us now. Amen. So let us go on. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this cloud of witnesses are the 17 people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and others who followed, including Moses, Joshua, all of those people lived by faith, and many others who are not named. That is why here he's referring to them as a cloud of witnesses. What do we do? Let us draw off everything that hid us and the sin that so easily entangles. So here the other is comparing our life, our Christian life, as a race where people run to compete. That is why he's talking of throwing off anything that would entangle us. It's like we are running and we need to be free. So there are some things in life which, which entangle us, which will not allow us to move on. It could be something, it could be a scene, a behavior, which you are, you are good in practicing that scene. You don't even see it as a scene, but it is denying you an opportunity to, li to live the life as God wills. So there is a way, he is setting an example of how people run in competition. They draw everything. If it is a heavy jacket, you put it off. It is, if it is heavy boots, you put them off. You put the right juice, uh, boots, which you can use to run. And in the clothes, which you can run easily. So you put off everything that will stop you. Then he says, and he let us run with the perseverance. There is a match for us. It is a race marked for us. 
You know what is, it means to run. You must persevere. We are aware of many uh, distance running. You can, there is a hundred yard, there is a, a thousand, there is a marathon. All of these are games. And when you are running, your body must have done some exercises. You cannot win if you just stay at home, then you wake up and you say you are going to participate in marathon. Because your body can't, you must exercise. And now because the other is comparing our life like running, we have to keep on comparing that physical life with the spiritual life. So there is a, a race put where all of us, we have to run with an aim of winning. So we must do everything on how we run. We must be as free as we can. Yeah, free as we can. And we must be focused. You see the way where people are running, how they draw lines? And you must be on your line. If you cross the line and move into another person's line, you will be disqualified. There are those rules. So we must be focused. How do we focus in this race of Christian life? We must fix our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, the author here is encouraging us as we continue to live this Christian life. We focus our eyes on Jesus because it is only Jesus who is perfect. And he endured to reach that possession. He endures and endured opposition. And we all know what it is. In during his three and a half years of ministry in Galilee, in Judea, and sometimes he passing through Samaria. He had the opposition. There were groups, religious groups. In the Jewish community, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Pharisees were the most because they were custodians of the law of Moses. They studied the law and they wanted everybody to keep the law. They created several other laws and added to what God had given them. And life was very tough. They made it tough for everybody. And now, in ordinary day life, Jesus did not agree with them because they had formulated these laws to make it difficult for people. So they kept on opposing him. They were a very powerful opposition. So, he conquered, he won, because he persevered with their verbal opposition. They arrested him, they flogged him, they killed him, and yet he died and rose again. Amen. Therefore, in this journey, as we move as Christians, people who had been earlier in the traditional religion, of your, my traditional religion, 
And some of us who are born in Christian faith, many people of my age and even older were born by parents who had already believed in Jesus Christ. So we know Jesus very well. We know God very well. But we are now addressing this issue in every community where they are going back to their traditional way of worship. Okay, so let us keep the faith. Be focused. Be free. And also be as faithful as we can. That is what we are required to do. And we do not lose heart. So let us persevere what is coming against us. Let us persevere. Then he moves on in verse 4. In your struggle against the sin, you have not yet resist resisted to the point of shedding your blood. He knows what they have been going through. The author of this book knew what they had gone through. So he's now telling them, the war you have been on, the battles you have fought, it has not come to a point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that he addresses you as a father addresses his son? So these words are sent to us by God as a father addresses his son. So God loves us because he loves us. That is he, why he wants us to, to know all this information. It is being brought to us because we are his children. It says, this is what the word says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's displaying and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the lord disciplines the one he loves we shall put more i will put more words on on this to explain just a little bit more that he rebukes us because he loves us and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Therefore, God loves us. He has accepted us as his children. So the one true God I'm talking about loves us. He has accepted us as his children. Amen. So he will always rebuke us. How does he rebuke? Then he compares himself to a father. You are father when you are a small child. Can you imagine the discipline you received when you did something wrong? Not because your father hated you, it's because he loved you. And that is you, who you are. It is unfortunate now we are living in the days when a child discipline is being withdrawn. It is the will of God that the children should be disciplined by their parents. By the time they go to the world, they are already disciplined. Amen. But if we withdraw the discipline, then the world will teach them. Exactly. Okay, let us move on. He's telling them endure hardship as a discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes a discipline, then you are not legitimate. If God will let us just move on in the whole world and do whatever we, we want, that he fails him to call us his children. Because his children, he will 
displaying. Then you then he says you are not illegitimate. If you are not being displaying, then you are not illegitimate children, not true sons and daughters at all. At all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who displayed us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and life? Who is that? How much more must we submit to God Almighty? The one true God. He's being referred here as the Father. Amen. Of spirits and life. He's our Father. Amen. They displayed us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. As we continue to be disciplined, we shall be more holy. That is the only way of attaining that level of righteousness through discipline. And as we are being disciplined, there is something to learn. We learn something new when we learn to obey God. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I'm talking of here, and the word is telling us something about discipline and the way God disciplines his children. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make careful paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. Amen. Let me add a few things on this. We have learned that when we undergo some form of discipline by God, we are loved by Him, the one true God, and He has accepted us as His children. And we always we are learning, we have a lesson to learn. And he disciplines us as a response to disobedience. When we disobey what he has told us, like now, he has told us he's the only one of God whom we should worship. If we disobey and, and worship other gods, definitely. He will discipline us. Amen. We shall receive discipline. But one thing before I conclude. Sometimes we make mistakes of interpreting the word. If you face every disaster, it is not every disaster which is a discipline. So we must be life in spirit to be able to detect that what I am going through is a discipline because of my disobedience. But not everything, not if somebody die in your family, oh, that is a discipline. Or somebody was sick, that is a discipline. No, we must develop a relationship which will make us know this one is God displaying me and I must change my way of living. Amen. I wanted to give just a few examples. The nation of Israel had met their God at Mount Sinai. They had been told by their fathers from Abraham about this one God, the Jehovah 
I, who I am. I am who I am. He has so many names. So they knew they have a God. But still, they lived in Egypt, where idols were being worshipped. So they had been influenced by the Egyptians to worship the idols. That is why when Moses went to the mountain and he overstayed because he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights, they forced Aaron to make an idol so that they could worship that idol. That was a big sin, and whatever happened to them because of that act of worshipping an idol, so many of them died. That was a discipline, and those who were left feared God. Amen? That was a discipline because of what they did. Let alone, they entered the land, the promised land. They had been warned, when you enter the land, never worship other gods. Never marry those, the cows of those people, because they will influence you to worship their gods. What did they do? They went on marrying those cows, and one time the king, King Solomon, married so many of them. He married the daughter of king of Egypt and others, the neighbors who are Gentiles against the will of God. And God sent to them prophets to go and warn them, stop worshiping idols. Prophet after prophet. And they didn't listen. What happened? They were taken captive. The whole nation was taken captive to Babylon. That was a display. And in fact, in fact, it was. Because since they came back from Babylon, they, are, they have never been connected with the idol worship again. They knew what it was. Because they were taken to go and serve as slaves a nation which was worshipping idols. So when they came back, they trusted their God. And up to now, Jews do not worship idols. Amen? I'm just giving you an example of discipline. If you are warned and you don't listen, God will come with a whip to straighten you as now we are just talking, telling you there is one true God, and yet the people are flocking to worship other gods. Time is coming when God will come with a whip and display in you. Let me give you another example. There were so many. There are so many I cannot tell you all of them. One prophet, the oldest prophet in, not the oldest, the oldest or the first foreign missionary in Israel. That was Jonah in the Northern Kingdom. He was sent to Nineveh with God's message to go and preach to them, tell them in 40 days, if you don't repent, God will destroy the city. What happened to Jonah? He said, never. I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Spain. That is the land called Tarshish. Tarshish is that region of Spain, that western region, part of Europe. Then he boarded a ship in Joppa and he started crossing the Mediterranean Sea. What happened to him? The discipline he got was tough because the ship he was traveling in was shaken until he had to tell them, I'm not telling you the full story, just by the way to explain a little bit. 
He told them, it is me. I would disobey the God. I'm running away. It is true he was going to the west and Nineveh was at the east. Far away in the northern part, northeast, around somewhere in Syria. And that is the total disobedience of God's will. What, did, what happened to him? He added into the belly of a fish. I can't even imagine. How was he breathing inside the belly? And yet he was praying when he was there inside the belly. Do you know what happens when something is swallowed? When a creature, like a human being or an animal, is swallowed by a fish, that fish will release some gases which will cause the flesh to decay. So when he came out of the fish, I think he was not a person you would like to look because his skin must have been burned by the gases. That was discipline. Amen. There are more, more. Therefore, let us be in the spirit of God. Let us be believers of this God so that we know when he is displaying us. We know when he is commanding us and we do exactly what he wants. And right now what God wants is that we worship him alone. His first commandment was, you shall not have any other God beside me. He is the only one God. There is no other. And now nations are worshipping other gods. What do you think God is fearing when you go and slaughter animals as he sacrifices to those gods? That one true God gets angry. But he is very patient. That is why we are just living. We do all these bad things against him and he's holding his peace. But a time will come when he will pour his anger on humanity as he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. During that time, people were doing exactly what they are doing now. And yet, they don't believe. They know what happened to Sodom, so to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are pretending as if there is nothing. But God has given instruction on what we should do and what we should not do. And now, may the Lord, one true God, Jehovah, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, bless you and help you to decide, to make a decision on who you are going to worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know the way, the way to reach that God. Is, there is only one way. Amen. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ. And this was his testimony before he left. That day, before he went to the cross, he had a meeting with his disciples. And he delivered very precious message. And if you want to read that message, go to the Gospel of John, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and he concluded with the 17. In that night, he told them this in chapter 14, verse 1. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. He was talking to the Jews. Who knew the Father? They had been told about the Father by Moses. And now he's telling them, 
Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Even now, you will not reach God the Almighty. I know there are very many people who say they have no problem with the Father, no problem with God. They only have a problem with Jesus. Without Jesus, you cannot see the Father. That is the good news for all of us today. May the Lord bless you. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you because of your word. You have spoken to us. Help us to believe. Increase our faith that we are able to run this race which has been set in front of us. Help us to seek you only through Jesus that we may know you, the one true God. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Shalom. God bless you. Amen.